the reality is we are we need to be good neighbors with one another in mm -hmm. rural communities because we we won't make it if we if we don't right just the environmental and distant circumstances and resources and whatnot we need to whether we like our neighbors or not we're there for each other yeah hands down and that's that's a really important thing in my mind that that perhaps gets lost in larger population bases just because you you also can gravitate towards your like-minded group this is a new angle and i'm your host justin angle marketing professor at the university of montana this podcast is my chance to speak with cool people doing awesome things in and around the great state of montana we are proudly underwritten by first security bank and blackfoot hey folks welcome back and thanks for tuning in this week is number 11 in the Sea Change series, and it's one I'm very excited about. Sarah Calhoun is the founder of Red Ants Pants, a product and brand born of a determination to find a better solution. For years, Sarah worked in the outdoors in clothing designed for men, Carhartts, Dickies. Those were the only options. With no experience in apparel or design or business, she saw the need for a better solution and figured out how to make it happen. In this conversation, we learn the Red Ants Pants origin story, how Sarah's expanded her platform to her music festival and her foundation, and why she decided to do all of this from the small town of White Sulphur Springs, Montana. There are some profound and important ideas in this conversation. We talk about diversity and community in ways that I hope motivate you to think differently about our current politics. We also talk about the value of shared physical labor and why Sarah thinks it's uniquely empowering. It was great to learn more about Sarah and her inspiring work, and I'm excited for you to learn more about her as well, right now. Okay, so we're here today with Sarah Calhoun. Sarah, great. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having me. So it occurs to me in researching your history that I think we share a mutual friend. You've referred to your mentor who worked for Patagonia in Bozeman, and you've got to be talking about Richard Sibrel. I sure am. Yeah. So how did you cross paths with Richard? So that was a very fateful day early on back in 2004, the very first weekend I moved to Bozeman, Montana, had mm -hmm. never been to this beautiful state. And I had recently purchased a copy of Small Business for Dummies because at that point <laughs> I did not. Like the yellow and the, <laughs> true. Right, the paperback. The very right one. Okay, yeah. Wow. Because I didn't know what a business plan was at that time. Mm -hmm. And I was looking to start this pants company. And so I was downtown at the old Leaf and Bean coffee shop reading this book and uh, Richard noticed and... He, we got to talking, like, hey, what business are you starting? And I said, workwear for women. And he, uh, oh, wow. you know, that it turns out. That was all he needed to say, I'm mm -hmm. sure. Yep. For the past 20 years, you know, he's done product design for Patagonia. So mm -hmm. he became a phenomenal mentor. He invited me to his shop a week later and yep. gave me loads of contacts and advice and just said, Sarah, you're on to something big here. I think you need to move on this now. Sure. And so. at that point, did you have any design experience? And much sewing knowledge or any of that? None whatsoever. You just thought, okay, I'm sick of wearing pants that don't fit. I mm -hmm. want to do something better. Yep. It came out of necessity fully. Wow. I had no business background, no marketing, none of it. And had you, before that, I mean, did you come straight out of the outward bound instructing, instruction role to just deciding I'm going to do this pants thing? Mm -hmm. Yep. I had spent wow. about four years uh, working seasonal jobs, instructing for outward bound and leading trail crews, that sort of thing all yeah. over the country. And and really just got very fed up with wearing men's pants. That's all that was on the market at that time. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. square men's pants don't fit curvy women. Right, right. Um, I'm just trying to think of like what I get understanding that there's there's a hole in the marketplace and a solution that's out there that's not working for you. Like you got to make something different. Most of the time that starts with somebody just tinkering with existing products in, in their own lab. Like that's kind of what Richard does, right? Mm -hmm. Like he'll just sort of take what's out there, and if you can make it work for him, great. If he has to start from scratch, fine. Were you doing a little bit of that? Were you tinkering or just thinking, I have to do this as a business to start? You know, I had uh, I was wearing my dad's hand-me-down Carhartts that I would I would literally hand sew, okay. you know, different knee right. patches and, and, you know, change the hems and the fit around the waist and whatnot. But I'm not a seamstress by any means. Um, so I would, you know, I was I was playing around with it, but I, not in any technical fashion. Sure. Um, yeah, and one of Richard's first pieces of advice was get some experience on the production floor. So I got a job sewing backpacks in Bozeman okay. to actually learn how to sew and how so patterns like work. Mystery Ranch, is that? It was actually Wookiee Backpacks. Wookiee, okay. Yep. yep, way back when. It's an interesting name for a backpack. Mm -hmm. That was a family name. Were they furry? No, no. sorry, I couldn't <laughs> resist. Anyway, okay, so you got, the, you got the business off the ground. What were some of the key milestones in sort of making you think that this actually could be a viable business. Mm -hmm. 
So getting the the first prototype actually sewn yeah, and big. fitting well was a was a huge one. Um, Richard connected me with a woman pattern maker down in Malibu who used to work for Patagonia as well, mm-hmm. and we spent about eight months working back and forth sewing. I would I would sketch out a design for the features I knew I wanted in a pair of pants and the functionality behind the features, and and then we would get sort of prototypes sewn up and ship them back to Montana. I'd try them on, say a little more here, a little more there. And at the time, my roommate, um, Sam, Sam Bloomquist now, she was uh, very, she was our straight cut fit model and I was the curvy cut fit model okay. and it's just how it worked. So yeah. so we got prototypes done for each and then once the fit got to where we wanted it, it was, that was a big day um, after eight months. And I still, I hadn't met the pattern maker that whole time. It was all. Oh, uh, all remote. All, yep. All okay. remote. Mm-hmm. And so you've got this kind of, you know, product that you, th- you, you, th- you're pretty sure that other women are going to want. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I, I got to have, you, you got to be talking to your friends and sort of your network and figuring out, okay, more than just me and my roommate are interested in this. How do you kind of go from prototype to actually selling them? Mm-hmm. Great question. <laughs> um, so as, as you can imagine, starting a business, there's not just the actual product, but you then need, you need the name and the logo and the yeah. brand and the business model and the website and the financing and then how do we actually manufacture these? Where do we find fabric? How do we, you know, how do we fund all this? I mean, you've probably exhausted the book, right? Mm-hmm. The business for small business for dummies at this yep. point. Yep. <laughs> yeah. And and you know, there's not a there's not a blueprint for how do you start a brand new brand for women's yeah. pants. Almost that you a new wanna, category. Yeah, that you want to make in America. Um, there's not a blueprint for how do you do that on a shoestring budget with zero experience no. in the apparel industry. That That's would be a long a, title for, for yeah. dummies at <laughs> yeah. the end. That would be hard. Yeah. Um, so I had a lot of work cut out, and I was trying to do my homework as best I could and mm-hmm. find good mentors like Richard, and he connected me with a lot of great folks. Um, you know, it's you, you're you making it all up as you go. Um, yes. For sure. And so at what point in this process do you decide, okay, Bozeman's too big. I want to move to White Sulphur Springs. I'm going to take my small business and move it to a smaller town. Mm-hmm. So, that's not like the standard play. No, it's not. Um, it's certainly not. And it's one that fits with the culture of our brand when I yeah. look back. But yeah. it's it's certainly not location, 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 sure. like they used to say about retail. So I, I about a year after moving to Bozeman, it, it was too big of a town for okay. me. I, and I had grown up in a small farm town back east. Yeah, where in Connecticut was that? A little town called Cornwall. Yeah, I know Cornwall. Grew up in New Hampshire. Oh, nice. My, my family lives in, uh, some family lives in Guilford on the coast. Mm-hmm. And then I worked at Yale for a little bit. So okay. I kind of have a sense for that zone. Yep, right up Route 7. Yeah, so I could see coming from farm country, mm-hmm. uh, that would contribute to an interest in maybe returning to some more rural mm-hmm. environs. Mm-hmm. And... I, uh, the Ivan Doig book, This House of Sky, mm-hmm. had come across my, my plate, and that's his memoir of growing up in White Sulphur, of course, yeah. phenomenal read. And I read it, and I was like, oh, White Sulphur sounds like a good town, and went to visit one time, found an old historic saddle shop for sale on right on Main Street, had a, a little apartment behind it, and two apartments upstairs to rent out, and as you can imagine, the real estate in White Sulphur is considerably more affordable than Bozeman. Sure. And it, the town just felt right, didn't know a soul, and I was 25 and went for it. And so, and how long ago was that? That was in 05, so 15. So, you know, so, so now, with technology, that doesn't seem so outrageous, mm-hmm. right? But 2005 was a, a little bit different, like being able to sort of construct and operate a small business that far off the grid, so to speak, is a little mm-hmm. bit more of a daunting challenge, I mm-hmm. would think. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, how do you, how do you set up shop? Yeah, so did a lot of renovating in the actual storefront, um, which was fun because it's, you know, got the original tin tile ceilings and um, beautiful old brick building and incredibly cold, only wood heat yeah. for the first 10 years Oof. I was there. It was um, so hard mornings. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, it just, it took a lot of grit. You know, you, you get to know folks in the community, you start pitching in and know who you can lean on and build build that up. And, you know, at the same time, I had been surveying different women in the outdoor industry and in trades jobs and whatnot to see what they would want for a product. So the business is coming along at the right, same time right. um, as I was getting settled there. And then, and you know, finding a manufacturer and getting actually getting the fabric imported and um, getting into production and getting all of the shelves built and then filled and, you know, all of it, every step of the way. There's a lot of, there's a lot of sawdust. Absolutely. So where is, and manufacturing is in the United States, where? Mm-hmm. In Seattle, currently. Okay. Yep. And, and probably have distribution out of Seattle? 
I would assume. They ship everything right to White Sulphur. We okay. distribute everything from our county. So you have your retail shop and distribution out mm-hmm. of White Sulphur. Yep. Okay. Yep. What was behind the choices you made to, to do that? Because I'm sure there's pressures to do manufacturing in cheaper locations oh, and, absolutely. and so forth. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. When I started, it was I was paying forty eight fifty a pair just for the cut and sew. That's wow. not for the rest of the cogs or materials or overhead. Yep. Um, and I could have gotten that done in China for under 12 bucks sure. a pair. Um, but to me, I, I just wanted to, I wanted to have a personal relationship with our manufacturers, which is much easier in Seattle, certainly. Um, and minimums and quicker turnaround and awesome quality and working conditions, all of that. It's just, it seemed a lot more doable to me. And, and I, I believe in providing jobs here. Absolutely. I mean, all those sort of principles certainly line up mm-hmm. and they make, they make sense. But at the same time, Knowing that that means you're going to be selling a pair of pants for whatever, 140 bucks, mm-hmm. that has to be, I mean, it has to take a lot of courage to, mm-hmm. or confidence to know that I, 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 I have a market for this. People mm-hmm. are willing to pay that to support not only the novelty of the product, the importance of it, but the mission. Yep, absolutely. And it's and at the beginning, it was so hard to stand up, you know, when customers would walk in and be like, you know, at first they were one hundred and nineteen dollars, and even then, it, one hundred and nineteen bucks for a pair of pants, and yeah. I'd have to stand there. Well, they can there. get Carhartts down the street yeah. at the hardware store yeah, for, for forty bucks yep, or whatever. Exactly, exactly. Um, and especially tricky because we're targeting a you know a blue collar market of our core customer, the folks mm-hmm. that are actually using these pants in the field and in the labor job. So, and that doesn't necessarily match. Um, so that's that's a tricky bit, and it's taken it's taken a long time to to really feel confident in standing up and saying, yeah, they're made in America, and we're providing jobs here, and we have pants that fit, and they're good quality, and they're going to last you three times as long as you know the competition. Yeah, and I'm sure that you know once sort of the the pants get a little traction locally beyond that, like mm-hmm. you're starting to get you know the brand story starting to resonate, and how are you kind of I, I would imagine some of this is emerging organically, but at the same time, you've had some incredible press placement, some great awards. I mean, all well earned. But how are you thinking about getting your message out at this point of the business? It's a great question, and we're actually working on that right now. Sure. Um, I think a lot of it comes down to, you know, we have we certainly have challenges in, in addition to being rural and made in America. Um, there. You know, it's a new product, a new brand where people want to try the pants on. Even online, it's tricky to buy things. Um, so figuring out how to better educate our customers about what size to order right. if they are coming off the website. Um, but also, we, we just recently did some pop-up shops around the state. And folks in Helena, we went to the base camp, and we had so many customers come in and just say, oh, I've been wanting to try these pants on for years. And oh, I'm so glad you came to Helena. And in my mind, I'm like, White Silver is an hour and a half away. Like, come on yeah, yeah. us. But that doesn't always happen, huh. right? So we really have to get to where the people are in addition to serving online and better educating. Which is a challenge because you're all direct to consumer, mm-hmm. right? You're, there's yep. no intermediaries yep. with you. So yep. yeah, getting, if, you, if, you're, if your value proposition is fit, trying mm-hmm. to communicate that when they, not everybody can come to your shop, yep. get their hands on the product, that's, that's a challenge. It is, certainly, certainly. And initially we did something called Tour de Pants where we took right, an air, right. Airstream trailer on the road and did pants parties all over the country, which was fantastic. Um, but, th- but I... You know, I had to close the shop and be away from there and be on the road all the time. So uh, maybe doing doing more work like that, boots on the ground around the around the country, hiring some regional reps, that sort of thing, or working with good independent retailers that, that it does make sense to, to collaborate with. Sure. At what stage do you think, okay, I got this pants thing figured out. It's time to start a music festival. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that doesn't... So- <laughs> Yeah, I, I, that probably isn't the way the average person would draw it up. No, they don't write that in the business no. book, it turns out. <laughs> um, so after about five years in business, pounding the pavement with yep. Tour de Pants, I was, it was, there was a couple things going on. One, we, we needed more branding for the pants, right, more marketing. Um, but the other big thing was just meeting so many phenomenal people around the the country, and especially in rural areas, and we're so isolated in our pockets that yeah. um, – I think bringing them together and using music to do so was really the point of that and to celebrate rural Montana. And, um, and that was a huge, huge risk. And I was working, so there's the Red Ants Pants LLC, the for-profit. Sure. And then with the festival started a nonprofit, the Red Ants Pants Foundation, a 501c3. And so literally working with a $0 budget that first year, um, I had to borrow, I think, 10 grand for two weeks okay. to, to, patch things together between the, the ticket sales and the, the talent deposits. But after that, we've been, we've been 
above the board. Oh, yeah. Since, which is unheard of for festivals. We lucked out in such a huge way. I mean, with a lot of hard work and grit and community support and a lot of incredibly helpful people. So did it start with an interest in doing something with music or did it start with doing something to celebrate your rural community? Like, how did, how did it end up where it is? Like, how did that idea coalesce? So in with my background of Trails and Outward Bound, there's, yeah. you know, we do these work skills programs where you, you learn how to use all the tools and do all the actual manual labor in the backcountry and whatnot. And having, there's something really special about having people coming together and learning things. So it, 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 I had always dreamed about having these, these workshops where you have people coming together in somewhat of an educational capacity and then having a big party at the end with sure. music, right? Yeah. So this is, <laughs> the the proportions are a bit off, but that's really what it comes down to in the core of what we're doing. We have a big demo- demonstration area for the festival and you don't see that at other festivals where you can learn ranch roping and sheep shearing and trailer backing and cross-cut saw use and competitions and all the, the actual skills on the ground that are really important to, to rural Montana. Um, so it was kind of fun coming from that angle, but again, using the music as a tool to bring people together. Yeah, all the music is almost people. the substrate. To, it is to, to yeah. promote the kind yep. of shared work experience mm-hmm. and the educational experience you're mm-hmm. trying to to get after. What is it about those sorts of experiences? Share. I mean, I worked on a, a Appalachian Mountain Club trail crew growing up, and something about it. I mean. Mm-hmm. Do, you describe it as sort of pretty unfun labor, but mm-hmm. when you're sharing it with a bunch of people on a team, there's something about it that's powerful. Absolutely, and you look you look at our kind of on the back end of the festivals. We have over 220 volunteers and 90 staff, and you know the whole community pitching in all summer long, and um, and the, so many of them are coming and they're not getting paid and they're working their yeah, butts off yeah. in the hot, dusty, dry like all all summer, you know, um, and just to pull off this this big party in a cow pasture and but I think I think what I'm seeing is that people are really craving and needing to be part of something worthwhile mm-hmm. we don't have that in our culture as much anymore of yeah. feeling part of something and working hard together and when you when you share blood sweat and tears together there's a bond there that that's pretty important and do you think that's different in rural communities versus urban communities like what's that how's that distinction bear out to you I do and I I've I struggle to figure out how to say this appropriately but the reality is we are we need to be good neighbors with one another in mm-hmm. rural communities because we we won't make it if we if we don't right just the environmental and distant circumstances and resources and whatnot we need to whether we like our neighbors or not we're there for each other yeah hands down and that's that's an, a really important thing in my mind that that perhaps gets lost in larger population bases just because you you also can gravitate towards your like-minded groups right and in rural there's not enough mm-hmm. people to you have to find commonalities with people you otherwise wouldn't in small towns and i think there's something really really valuable to that yeah that makes a lot of sense when there's more people you can sort of selectively sort mm-hmm. to people that look like you think like you believe the same things that you believe mm-hmm. in rural communities it's harder to do that mm-hmm. you got to make teammates yep. with with people that are different yep absolutely which is interesting because you don't typically think of rural communities as diverse true but, but there's a, a diversity of a sort that's really important yep that's exactly when i when i say i moved from bozeman to white sulfur i and i i jokingly say i did it for diversity but it's i did like there's yeah. obviously white sulfur is not very culturally racially diverse per se, but um, in Bozeman, I found myself with people with the same politics, the same clothes, the same supers, the same music, the same everything, which was wonderful, but not a challenge on a personal character level. Certainly not, no. And it's and, and it's sort of, we have a preference for ease, mm-hmm. right? Yep. And, and all those sorts of things, so I can see how we select yeah. those environments that feel safe. Yeah, one of my favorite pictures from the actually the first year of the festival was um, and actually an MSU professor sent this up, and it was uh, two guys with their backs to the camera it didn't appear they knew each other well. They were just sharing a beer and watching the show. And on the back of one guy's shirt, it read, Save the Planet. And the other guy who must have worked for an asphalt company had said, Pave the Planet. Oh, gosh. Wow. Like, and you can't make that up, right? It's That's exactly what we're trying to do right there. And, and, it, and it somehow works with the sunsets and the landscape and the fact that this is a working cow, cow pasture, literally. Yeah. It's a cattle operation. Um, and you just throw in some good music and beer and just a bunch of set the tone right and have a good culture and people just behave in their best versions. It's really neat to see. How do you think about the importance of this story in the context of the kind of world we live in, right? There's this urban-rural divide, red state, blue state. You know, it, it sort of defines so much of the media environment right now how politics are conceptualized and what you're talking about, what you're building 
runs counter to a lot of those narratives. Um, do you think about that and explicitly how to get your story out there? Yeah, all the time. And I think I think we're doing it. I mean, I, I'm doing it personally just from a. Yes. I, like I moved yeah, to you're living it. I'm living it. It's very personal, um, and it's it's been fascinating to kind of see it play out on a larger scale with all these people coming to town and, you know, thinking about the rural and urban divide. And we talk about this a lot with my board for the foundation of is it what is what is it that we're trying to teach the world from our rural values? But also there's there's a lot of things from the urban that we need to, you know, trade that yeah. information. I yeah. kind of think of it as a two lane county road, right, where mm-hmm. it has to go back and forth. And um, and it should go back and forth. And Bozeman people should come to White Sulphur and see working cowboys. Like, that's a thing you don't see in Bozeman anymore, right. hardly at all. Um, and I, I think there's, again, a lot of the value base from rural that, and the work ethic and the self-reliance. And the, and those are the, those are the things we can teach at the festival, even if it's a, a 20-minute workshop on how to back a trailer with a woman teaching it. Like, that's, that's good stuff. A New Angle is brought to you by First Security Bank and Blackfoot. Two cool companies doing awesome things all over Montana. I'm Larry Summers, Harvard President Emeritus and former Treasury Secretary. You're listening to A New Angle. Yeah, how's it been received in the community of White Sulphur? How do they view the festival? Very well, fortunately. And I honestly wouldn't have gotten into this if if it wasn't um, highly, highly supported by the community. But... I mean, they the first year none of us knew what to expect as far as how many people were coming to town, and how it was you get like six thousand, yeah, six thousand in a town Crazy. of nine hundred. Yeah, so that, yeah, that tripled the county's population, <laughs> um, and and like you know the stores and restaurants hadn't really staffed up, or and we was like, oh yeah, music festival, we'll see who shows up and what's it's going to be, and it's uh-huh. always something exciting when there's something new in town. Um, but after they saw the volume of people and honestly the money coming through, like everyone yeah. is, is definitely taken advantage, which is fantastic. All the civic organizations and mm-hmm. the cattle women do breakfast in the campground and the rotary sells ice and all the school groups earn money picking rocks. And it's, it's really neat to see how that can spread across, across the board. And what's your, I mean, what's the kind of makeup of the, ba- of the, the, I mean, you, you painted a picture of, of diversity within the festival, like those two guys with the different mm-hmm. shirts. What's kind of the general makeup of the folks that, that come to the festival? It, it is across the board. We, I would say it's a little bit of uh, an older demographic than uh-huh. some of your classic um, festivals, um, probably 30s, 40s, 50s, more than teens and 20s, which honestly is w- wonderful yep. um, just for safety and w- we're it, not going for a huge a drunken concerns. party crowd, yeah. you know, um, and also very family friendly. We really put a lot of work into that. We have a kid's tent and... Um, we make camping very affordable for everyone and you can go in and out as you please and camping is right on site and we have hay wagon rides to get everyone back and forth and, um, free shuttles to get everyone to town and like around the clock, which is great. We want to make it a very safe, feel good event. Okay. And the proceeds from the event go to the foundation Mm -hmm. you started. So that's Mm -hmm. how the foundation's funded. What are the pillars of your foundation? Like, what are what are you trying to do with that? Yeah, the Red Ants Pants Foundation yeah. in support of women's leadership, working family farms and ranches, and trying to enrich our rural communities. Okay, and how do you do that? Like, how do you make choices about promoting those three or mm-hmm. supporting those three mm-hmm. pillars? Yeah, we've we've kind of got a tough elevator pitch. There's a lot of things I get excited about, right, so right. I've <laughs> added a lot, and then people are like, but "Are you music or pants or chainsaws?" and um, so we have we have uh, four programs really the festival being the the huge one, um, and then we have a grant program. So we've we've gifted over one hundred and ten thousand dollars to different programs and organizations across the state whose okay. projects parallel our mission within women's leadership, farming, and and the rural communities. So everything from helping support the Big Sandy Library to okay. um, to YWCA girls welding programs to. Um, there's this wonderful outfitting company up in Shoto, the only female-owned outfitting company in the Bob Marshall, and we, we bought oh, them wow. a mule, okay. which is fantastic. That's so, a transformative gift, I'm yeah, sure. Yeah, absolutely. And they actually they did a social media push to see what they should name it, and they ended up naming it Calhoun, which oh, very nice. <laughs> I feel like I can retire now happily. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's all sorts of terrible jokes I could summon right now, but I will yeah. not. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, and then additionally, we have a timber skills course. So it's a four-day course every fall in White Sulphur where we teach women how to run chainsaws and do carpentry, which is really neat. And there's been a lot of interest there and a lot of potential for expansion. And yeah, tell me more about that. You know, I mean, that's been an interesting thread of this is 
getting women into physical labor mm -hmm. scenarios. That's very, I mean, that's sort of the essence of the Red Ants Pants product. Mm -hmm. But what is it about taking women and putting them in these situations that you think is particularly empowering, mm -hmm. transformative? I think there's, I mean, there's things like running a chainsaw. Who gets, how do you, how do you learn how to run a chainsaw, right? Often it's, uh, as yeah. men just pick it up and start, start cutting, right? Which is fine and dandy sometimes. Yeah, but that could go either way. But, yeah, <laughs> but women don't, I mean, just generally speaking, wouldn't necessarily just do that. You, would, you don't see many dads teaching their daughters how to use the chainsaw. Yeah, and if you, like, that's how I learned was from my father. But right. if your dad doesn't know how to run a saw and or doesn't have the capacity to teach you, et cetera, or a husband, I mean, mm -hmm. that's a tricky combo to have a husband teach a wife how to run a chainsaw. Yep. There's not a lot of places unless you have a professional forest service or fire or BLM job that you're going to get training on a chainsaw, right? Um, and it's it's a phenomenal, obviously very practical tool that, mm -hmm. um, and a lot of my, one, our, our top instructor was a colleague from, from my trail crew program and okay. she used to be a wild firefighter and loves saws. And, um, and I also happened to have a meeting with the CEO of Still Chainsaw when they came through and they wanted to donate some and sponsor us. So we said, all right, let's start let's teaching women how to do this. And, um, you know, kind of back to that trails, you know, workshop model of let's get a bunch of gals together and, and create a really safe, comfortable environment and learn a, learn a really good tool. Yeah, it would seem that, you know, there's got to be some notion of, oh, I don't know quite how to phrase this, but like playing cowboy for a weekend, mm -hmm. which, is, which I think is just oversimplifying what's happening. Mm -hmm. Right. This is much deeper than just sort of pretending to be something else for a period of time and then going back to your office job or whatever. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, we had a 60 year old woman come from out of state and she had never touched a saw and had inherited a, a property in the Midwest and wanted to get the felled trees, you know, the trees that had come down, bucked up and whatnot. And she she said it was the most empowering day of her life to first start a chainsaw. Like it's a, it's a big deal. It's an intimidating yeah. tool for I'm sure. I'm scared of them. Yeah, as one should be. They can do a lot of damage yeah. and to learn how to do it safely and properly and then and then just in the essence of running a saw you you are empowered, right? And it's to some end. You know, it's not like and I don't want to be dismissive of, you know, ropes courses and that sort of outdoor experience, yeah. but those are kind of canned in the sense that you go to this thing, it's abstract, it's out of your out of your mm -hmm. comfort zone and that's sort of the design. And you leave with some wisdom, but this it's not like a functional skill mm -hmm, exactly. that, that, that comes with a wisdom that you yep. can then apply in your world. Yep. Right? Yep. And that, you know, that stream of that value, we try to weave through everything with um, with the self-reliance and the work ethic, and it ties with the work pants and, yeah. like, actually learning a skill you can use. And, and I think we're all better when, when we're self-reliant and can actually get boots on the ground doing some work. So this all ties together kind of when we... It takes a while to kind of get the story to tie all together. How do you kind of think about organizing all the various things you do in, into a tighter narrative? Because you don't always have, you know, 45-minute podcasts mm -hmm. to get it out there. Yep. Um, you got to reach customers quickly mm -hmm. in this environment, particularly in this media environment. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a great question, and it's one that I – I, I don't know that I have the, the perfect answer for yet. Sure. Um, and the, I, I will note that we have this additional program for girls' leadership, which we're, we're just in our second year of now, a year-long program for junior year high school girls. Oh, wow. Really in-depth. Only eight gallery selected. Residence program? Uh, nope. They're all in from their high schools oh, around okay. the state. And wow. we choose eight of them and get together for three weekends throughout the year and have webinars. And they do a community project, and they're paired up with a mentor. It's phenomenal, but we're really hitting onto something there. So that adds another element of... Um, there certainly is the the female and the rural thread through all of this, um, but again, the self reliance and the work ethic and the you know the neighboring, all of that is really really important to yeah. this. And I um, I'm still trying to figure it out honestly, but it is it's working. It's it's getting braided together. Sure, I mean because you got you got a lot of demands on your time. I'm sure you're being asked to do a ton of things. It also sounds like you're the sort of person spitting up new ideas. Often. Mm -hmm. So how do you make choices about where to allocate your energies? <laughs> uh, I don't always make them wisely but um, <laughs> or thoughtfully, but I, I guess where I get the most, I mean, there's, you know, there's things I get really excited about. And when, when I'm excited, I can, I can get a lot of stuff done, certainly. Yeah. Um, it makes me think, and I don't want to necessarily draw us too into politics. We touched on this earlier on, but, you know, the, the stuff you're doing kind of is a pathway to bringing people together. That seems like a core mm -hmm. principle. Um, 
Do you have any stories of people who might be very different kind of coming together at your festivals or <laughs> at you, in your shop or whatever mm -hmm. and just watching mm -hmm. sort of attitudes and, and, and barriers kind of break down? There was one pretty entertaining one where um, a couple of years ago we had a musician named Todd Snyder take the stage. Okay. And he's, a, he's an incredible songwriter but also very, very hippie um, left wing kind of guy. He plays barefoot, you know, that kind of guy. Long hair, plays sure. the part fully. And this actually came from us, a, uh, a news reporter out of Helena had watched this scene unfold. And so she's on the sidelines and she's looking down front. There was this big, burly biker dude wearing, you know, his leather cuts, his, you know, his vest yep. over this tank top that read, I eat hippies. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> and he's all playing tough and being a biker dude, right? And and then Todd Snyder comes on stage, this barefoot hippie, and the crowd goes wild. And she's watching, and this, this biker just kind of looks to his left and looks to his right, and then very slowly, subtly just zips up his vest over, <laughs> over his shirt. You know, and there's, it's little things, right? But we're on the front lines in some ways. It's, yeah, it's absolutely. pretty fascinating to see. Mm -hmm. and it reminds me of this, this is great, wonderful video that, I don't know, kind of went viral during the 2016 election, where this woman uh, puts on a Hillary Clinton for president T-shirt and goes to a Trump rally. And she's asking people if they've seen her dog. And you just see all these people melt, like, and they're looking at her, like, who's this, who's this alien in our community? And then, hey, have you seen my dog? Have you seen my dog? And just the whole, com the whole crowd just sort of rallies around her to find the dog. And you could run that social experiment both ways, mm -hmm. I'm sure, any, mm -hmm. any variations of it. But yeah, I mean, what you're getting at are these sort of seem to be themes of the human condition that mm -hmm. generalize in our, in our way forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Um, Let's pivot the conversation a little bit because this episode, as I mentioned before, is situated in, in our Sea Change series. The Sea Change is an initiative about safety, empowerment, and acceleration of women into careers of impact. It's, it's, a, it's a key tenet of what we're doing here at the University of Montana. Um, and there's a lot of overlap with, mm -hmm. with what you're trying to do. We're doing, as a, as a university, we're not so focused on the physical labor side. I mean, we're, this is sort of an intellectual enterprise, but, mm -hmm. but how do you, what's your response when you hear about a university thinking explicitly about ways to ensure safety, empowerment, and acceleration of women in our community? Oh, I think it's fantastic and about time. It's, yeah. Okay. It's great. <laughs> um, and again, I don't come from a background of any women's studies or whatnot. And mm -hmm. um, Yeah. What did you study? Gettysburg, right? Where did you, what did you yep, study? Environmental there? studies. Okay. Yep. Um, so it's it's fun to think about with being in my position now, and I get asked that question a lot about how, you know, the challenges of being a woman in business and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And I, I think we certainly have a lot of work to do and a lot of conversations to have and setting the standard and changing the narrative and all of that, that work that is being done. And this is exceptional that um, Montana's doing this. Um, I think, you know, it's, it's similar to our girls' leadership program where we have to, we have to get them early, right? And, yeah. and set them up for success and have all the resources and the mentors and, and knowing that this is a, a possibility that, you know, equality is actually a, an attainable thing, whether we, <laughs> whether we've seen that or not, it's real and it should be. Um, so I, I think it's fantastic. Yeah. How do you approach, I mean, do you have sort of a philosophy about approaching gender in your, in your business and in your foundation and in your festival? It's, it's funny. It's not, um, I guess I take I take a lot of things for granted. Certainly, I've I've been fortunate in that I haven't had to break through any glass ceiling because I, you know, I I work with all my staff are women. All yeah. of our customers are mostly women. Are you know the women that own the factory? It's a mother daughter team, and all okay. their sewers are women. And we're surrounded by by supportive, awesome women. Um, and I you know kind of I was breaking out of the box a little bit in just starting this, but I didn't know what the box was because I hadn't studied apparel manufacturing and whatnot. So um, I just went for it. So personally, that's been good. But then when you look at, um, you know, the programming we're doing on the ground with the with the timber skills and with girls' leadership, and and even we get feedback all the time from festival goers of, you know, women come in and they say, "Wow, you can tell this event is run by women." Like hmm. the details are, you know, paid attention to certainly. Yeah. Um, and also we've had other 
when you look at the festival leadership on staff, it is it is all female management okay. and top, you know, it's it's top down women, which it's working for us. And and that wasn't even necessarily an intentional decision. It was just I knew the people I could lean on and talk into some of these roles. And of course, we have lots of men on staff too, and um, and lots of men wearing our pants. But mm-hmm. um, oh yeah, I noticed that there's red ants pants for men now. Well, it's it, they're just wearing women's pants. Oh, okay, <laughs> nice. Yeah, they're just straight cut that fits just just great. Okay, so it's not an explicitly nope. targeted product. Okay, nope. <laughs> good. Nice. Switching it up a little because we've been wearing men's pants for a long time. So this, yeah, yeah, this this kind of pol- not policy, but this sort of organic sense that you know your festival is largely female employees, female volunteers, etc. Like, mm-hmm. does this just sort of happen because the brand is? Female in its in its orientation, I I'm sure. Is sort of a tribal effect there. Yeah, I'm sure there's some of that certainly, yeah. um, and also when you know when you look around and you know who you need to depend on, and it's you know have a certain collection of friends in your network, and yeah, for this kind of thing, the at least in my world, the women have risen to the top. When you've met, when you've had to kind of go outside of that network, whether it's for financing or bank mm-hmm. loans or mm-hmm. thinking about distribution or telling your story through media channels. Have you bumped up against any gender barriers there? No. No. I'm, that's I'm happy to say I haven't. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's certainly a rare case. But um, but also there's the, you know, the fact that it's a female-owned business in rural Montana made in America doing a little bit of, you know, the different thing. It, it's an easy story to tell. So I think that's that's helped certainly along along the lines. It's an easy story to tell, but like you said, you're doing it differently and breaking a lot of rules in a way. Mm-hmm. And a lot of those rules were sort of written explicitly or implicitly by men, mm-hmm. white men. Um, has there ever been any sense that, well, has there ever been any resistance on some of those dimensions? You know, the first the first bank I went into to ask for money um, in Bozeman at and I honestly don't remember which bank, and I'm glad because I shouldn't tell the story if I knew the bank. But, <laughs> but I, I was so proud of this new business plan, and you know, I, I don't think I was asking for a lot of money. But I, I went in, and he came, he came out, you know, this stodgy old white guy, and yep. he's like, just kind of threw the business plan down, and he's like, "We've already got Carhartts. What do we need these for?" Mm-hmm. Of course, <laughs> I was like, yep. I was like, "You don't have hips, like, and you're not wearing square pants with your hips." You know, bring out the female banker. Mm-hmm. But of course, at that time, that wasn't. There weren't any. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you get the loan? Yeah. Nope. I decided not to follow through with it. I ended up getting financing at a much lower interest rate privately. So outside. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So from somebody that bought into the mission. Yeah, my parents. <laughs> who bought into it fully. <laughs> yeah, that's a good source, right? Go with there a, first. A really good interest rate through their their bank initially. So Awesome. Yep. Okay, so what's next? I mean, what, what are you cooking up now? What's what's the next idea for you, Sarah? Mm, so many things. Um, I think there's a lot of potential for some additional rural programming. That's mm-hmm. something that we're kind of, just by the nature of who we are and what we're doing and where we're doing it, kind of poised for the next step of how do we really support rural Montana. Yeah. Um, that's a big one. I'm also it's working. It's got to be tricky to think. Sorry to interrupt, but it's got to be tricky to think about growth. Yes. I mean, your yep. your festival is what now about sixteen thousand mm-hmm. people. I mean, there's got to be a point at which it gets bigger than you want it to be. You have to think explicitly about growth of your of your business, both in terms of um, how large you want it to be to maintain the ethics of the brand, mm-hmm. but also how much the town itself can support. How are you kind of thinking about growth and, and all of those various things you do? Mm-hmm. It's a great question. And, and the festival in a big way is um, kind of the the most pressing one just because yeah. you know, a couple of years ago we had 18,000 and then it, it almost it was pushing our, our limits a little bit. And we really want to maintain the, the goodwill feel and make it a, sure. a better experience, not a bigger experience for folks. And um, but that's hard to do without necessarily capping it or how do you, you know, you still have to make it a revenue generating operation. And um, so we tried to scale back using, you know, tweaking the lineup a little bit last year, which worked great. Um, and this year's our 10 year, which is wow. going to be a big one, um, yeah. certainly. And um, which is hard to believe that much time has passed. But um, but really, we're we're paying a lot of attention to where's that perfect carrying capacity for a good experience that it hits all the all the buckets. Um, so that one's that one's been good, and we have a great team of board and advisors to help on that, and community members. Um, the pants company is always, you know, it's a, it's that classic challenge where I've 
I'd taken all my time and attention away towards the festival and the nonprofit, and then the the pants companies just you know cruising along and sure. it you know it we're not in a position right now where we're having to <laughs> hold back the growth currently okay um but it you know even looking to step up things in a in a bigger way there um but finding the right leadership to kind of be at the helm because i can't you know i'm running into capacity yeah, you can't issues. do it all yep. i mean you can't yep. clone yourself at least not yet nope and i gotta put myself in a position where i'm using my actual skills that are um because honestly selling pants is not my it's not my life's work. Sure. Yeah, that makes sense. It sort of empowers the life's work mm-hmm. in a way. Yep. A great jumping off point, and it's what we've built everything upon. But yeah. I need to keep pushing into new programming and such and getting good leadership in front of the other right. organizations. And, and this, yeah, I sort of asked you about growth in the midst of asking you about what's next. So <laughs> let's transition to what's next. Yeah. Um, so the expansion on this girls' leadership program, there's so much potential there, okay. and we're seeing so such. So right now thirst. it's eight students, mm-hmm. uh, high school students? Yep, junior in year. In Montana, okay. Mm-hmm. From rural Montana and a year-long program, and again, this is our second year in doing this, so we're, we're gaining in that in a big way, and I think that is scalable, similarly with timber skills. Sure. Um, but again, the, the rural piece, there's there's so much there, especially you know with the current rural-urban divide and what's what's possible and seeing how many entrepreneurs and innovators can make it in in rural places now across America so much potential I think that's untapped with you know historic buildings that need to be preserved and amazingly affordable real estate and yeah. a lot of our places have really good internet and you know you've got UPS post office and FedEx and workforce that's affordable and usually quite skilled and wants to stick around want to stick around ways yeah. to attract kids back to back to the small towns I think there's so much potential there quality of life cost of living is low all of it is it's prime I mean, it's not something you think of entrepreneurship. You don't think of entrepreneurship as a source of new jobs in small towns. Mm-hmm. Yep, it's it's true, but we should, right? The towns yeah, why all not? need we need it. We need small businesses. And we were just in another meeting talking about you know, why is all this focus on the unicorn entrepreneur yeah. that's just going to blow up and yep, have this yep. amazing return on investment and all this bullshit when why aren't we talking about the small businesses that, that aren't getting huge but are sustainable and are committing to their community and, you know, have the relationships with their vendors and their customers and their employees and really treating everything the way it should be treated rather than just aiming for bigger bust. Yeah. I mean, that blows in the face of a lot. A lot of the market dimensions dictate those chasing those unicorns and mm-hmm. these crazy valuations yeah, and, it's awful. and whatnot. But yeah, when you look on the backside of a unicorn, so to speak, um, it's not pretty. Like what's, what's being, you're not treating people well. Oh yeah, because it's just going for profit, and that's 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 not a business climate I want to be in. I mean, it seems as if, and we could derail the conversation with with this sort of talk, but you know, it seems as if the emerging business model in Silicon Valley is to disintermediate the human being to the extent possible. Mm-hmm. I mean, you take Uber for example; like they've created a product where you don't really have to interact with the driver. Mm-hmm. And in fact, I think that's the ultimate vision is to replace the driver with driverless cars. And like, to the extent that you can take a human out and all the costs associated with a human, that leads to great market multiples. That's a big problem. When we need to employ a populace, we need to give them dignity. We need to make them feel part of a community. And a lot of these business models work against that, I think. Yeah, and just basic human connection. Yeah. It's not a bad thing to have to talk to somebody. That's actually encouraged in my mind. Like, that's probably a big part of our cultural problem right now. Well, and it right goes now. back to exactly what you're saying. In a rural community, you don't ha- you, you're not able to make choices yep. about who you ask to help you drag your truck out of the ditch or yep. whatever it is, exactly. right? Because there's no way to sort mm-hmm. into, into like-minded groups. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Well, Sarah, this has been awesome. I really appreciate you coming in, sharing your story. Um, how can people learn more about you and your work and your, your company, the Festival Foundation? Where can they find you online? Mm-hmm. So for pants, it's redantspants.com. And then the festival is redantspantsmusicfestival.com. And the dates is summer July 23rd through 26th. And for the foundation and all our programs there, redantspantsfoundation.org. Sounds like folks who want to go to the festival should act sooner than later. Right. Absolutely. We'll have our big lineup release event April 4th, and that's when we share the bands that are coming for our big 10-year, and tickets go on sale that evening. Awesome. Well, Sarah, thank you. Keep doing what you're doing, and I'd love to hear more about it down the road. Thank you so much. Okay, that one was super fun. Don't miss out on the 10th annual Red Ants Pants Music Festival 
it's sure to be a special one. All right, coming up next week, we have staff writer at Wired Magazine, Megan Multaney. Megan writes at the intersection of health, science, and technology. Get ready to learn all about CRISPR, the DNA of things, and other mind-bending topics next week. Thanks for listening to A New Angle. We really appreciate it. And we're coming to you from Studio 49, a gift from University of Montana alums Michelle and Lauren Hansen. And remember that A New Angle is supported by CED, Consolidated Electrical Distributors. These guys pretty much sell anything electrical you would ever need, but they also hire a ton of our students. If you want to learn more about jobs at CED, visit cedcareers.com. Before we go, I want to thank some important peeps, executive producer Stefan Borsum, and interns Aspen Runkel and Max Gibson. Huge thanks to VTO, Jeff Ament, and John Wicks for the tunes. And finally, props to Jeff Meese, our master of all things sound. Finally, if you have any questions, suggestions, comments, insults, whatever, please email me at anewangle at umontana.edu. Help us spread the word, and be sure to use the hashtag anewangle when you do. Thanks a lot, and see you next time.